You're listening to Online Pet Health Podcasts with Dr. Megan Kelly, continuing education for veterinarian rehabilitation therapists. Learn more at OnlinePetHealth.com. Hey, Vet Rehabbers. Today, I speak with one of our longtime lecturers, Dr. David Dacus, and a topic that he is really passionate about. If you're interested in listening to his very first interview that he did with me back in 2018, which was episode 11, the topic was veterinary rehab from the surgeon's point of view. Now, the great thing about David is that he is a surgeon, but he is also a vet rehabber. Now, this topic today I feel is a really important one for us as vet rehabbers. Is often when we're doing rehab and a case is not responding well, we need to be able to pick up that it's a possible surgical complication and maybe refer back to the referring vet or surgeon. And we also need to know whether a case that is not improving has anything to do with the specific rehab protocol that we have put in place for them. Before we head over to the podcast, I want to say a quick shout out to Tori Edwards for her great message. She said, thank you, Anand Petal. Your content helped me through my vet physio degree and during the last six months of setting up my own business. Such an amazing platform that I'm very grateful for. Thank you so much, Tori. I love reading your reviews, guys. It really gets lonely online. So please post a review. Let me know that you're there joining me every week and listening to the Veterinary Rehabilitation Podcast. Take a screenshot of this podcast on your phone. Post a pic as a story. Tag us in. I'd love to hear from you. Tori, please get hold of me on meg at onlinepetalth.com. I'd love to gift you with a limited edition Veterinary Rehabilitation mug. Now we just loaded the this week's webinar onto our equine platform. It was managing the musculoskeletal health of the stable horse by Gillian Zabor. So our equine members, you can find that new addition to our library. A big thank you to Response System for sponsoring that webinar. So who's ready to learn about cranial cruciate ligament surgical complications? Over to my chat with David. Hey David, thank you so much for joining me. Hey, thanks so much, Megan. I'm happy to be here. David, I'm really excited to chat to you today about a topic which we've actually, you've covered in our online pet health webinars before. So I went and searched your name in the online pet health library and a number of webinars came up. But one that I really, really enjoyed was the one identifying complications during the post-operative period. And I love the title that you actually gave it. You said, I started rehabilitation therapy, but my patient isn't doing so well. Now, recently you authored a textbook on post-operative surgery complications in the cranial cruciate ligaments. So I'd really like to touch on this. And, and I think, you know, especially for us bed rehabbers, this is a, a common condition that we treat. And often what we'll see is that the case might not be doing so well. And then we have this question, is it something that is surgical? Is it a post-operative complication? Or is it something that we're doing? So maybe we're pushing the dog too much. Maybe we, our protocol isn't correct. So yeah, I'm really, really excited. I think this is going to be a great topic to talk about. Oh, absolutely. And I think it's a, uh, a topic that actually comes up very frequently, you know, just perusing online pet health Facebook page. There's, there's always questions about dogs or cats that may not be doing as well as we would like from either a surgical or a non-surgical component. So I think it's, it's definitely pertinent that we talk about these things. For sure. Before we chat about like the in-depth topic, I want to find out where was the inspiration to actually author the textbook? Yeah. So, you know, I, I never once thought to write a textbook. A, a colleague of mine, Dr. Ron Benamotes, he used to be in the United States practicing orthopedic surgery. He's originally from Israel. He's back there heading up the orthopedic department at the vet school there. He actually approached me and, and said, you know, I've, I've had this idea that we should, you know, talk more and bring up more about dealing with and addressing complications associated with cruciate ligament surgery. And, and I said, well, you know, they're out there. I mean, there's lots of papers. It's, it's mentioned in textbooks. And, you know, we, we kind of brush on it a little bit when we teach courses. And, and he said, no, no, he said, I think we need, we need something more. And his brother is a human surgeon. And he said, you know, on the human side, there's actually entire textbooks dedicated to addressing complications for particular surgeries. And I said, oh, really? And, and so he said, you know, I think we should try to, to put together a textbook. And so, you know, at that point, it was kind of like, okay, this is great. Let's, let's do that. And then once we actually sat down and thought about it, the first thing is, well, is there actually enough information out there to, to get a textbook fulfilled? And, and so we uh, went to a publisher, uh, Wiley Publishing, pitched the idea. They, they seemed to like it. So we typed up a proposal, had that reviewed. And then uh, the rest from there was basically 
getting authors and then starting the, the book writing process, which uh, I've learned is, is a very time consuming and complex process, you know, from uh, the beginning idea to the book being finished is probably about three years. So uh, it was certainly a lot of work. And, you know, really what we did was we took, because there's so many different surgical techniques for cruciate ligament repair, we, we basically said, let's make each chapter devoted to a type of cruciate ligament repair. So, you know, we first started out by talking about cruciate ligament disease in general and defining what exactly is a complication. Um, and then we have it broken into uh, intracapsular repair techniques, extracapsular repair techniques, um, osteotomy techniques. So things like TTA, TPLO, cranial closing wedge osteotomy, CBLO. We also have a chapter devoted to complications in the CAT following cruciate ligament rupture. Um, and then we also have a chapter on complications associated with rehabilitation following cruciate ligament rupture. Uh, and then also a chapter on arthroscopy uh, and complications there. And really what we tried to do was make it a mix between a typical textbook and sort of a coffee table book where it's very easy to follow. And there's lots and lots of pictures because what I think is important is when an individual elects to do a surgery, they should be able to first evaluate the patient as well as the radiographs and, and say to themselves, is this patient at a higher risk factor for a complication for this particular procedure? And then once that question has been answered in the operating room, they should be able to say, is what I'm seeing a complication or what I've done setting ourselves up for a complication. And then the next step being in the immediate post-operative period when evaluating post-operative radiographs to say, is there something I see here that could cause the complication? So a lot of it is, is based on trying to identify maybe complications that could occur before they occur. And then lastly is, uh-oh, something went wrong. How do I fix this? Rather than panicking to say, okay, this occurred, Number one, let's learn why it occurred. But number two, here's how we're going to remedy the, the situation. Yeah, I like it. I can't believe it took three years. I mean, if I look at a textbook, I mean, I think you know, it is overwhelming. But I love it if there are any vet rehabbers out there that are inspired to write a textbook. And I mean, there's one particular area of vet rehab, which I think hydrotherapy. I don't even think there is a specific hydrotherapy textbook. So, Not, not that I'm aware of. Only, only yeah, chapters, so but not, not books. Yeah, so I'd like to encourage you, vet rehabbers, and maybe they can reach out to you, David, to ask them, ask you sort of to guide them on the process to get, yeah, that, to get that textbook out there. So, I mean, looking at all these complications, I mean, what would you recommend to the vet rehabber that has a case, if they've got a case, remembering not all of them are vets, so they could be vet physios, or they could be hydrotherapists, if they have a case which has been operated on and the case is not doing well, what would your recommendation to them be? Yeah, ultimately, I, I think when we're in that rehabilitation period, one of the things that everyone, whether it's a veterinarian, whether it's a, a rehab therapist or physiotherapist or a hydrotherapist, um, you know, the, if we're seeing an animal that's not doing well, we first have to be the advocate and, and you know, tell the client this animal isn't progressing the way that I would expect them to. And I think the, the first starting point is to always recommend going back to the individual that did the surgery for a, a recheck. Now, what I have found, at least in, in the United States, what tends to happen is the dog goes back to the person that did the surgery. And, and of course, we're all, you know, proud people and, and we all want animals to do well. And, and many a times we tend to brush off and think, oh, the dog's not having a complication. Everything's fine. And they just send the dog back to rehab and say, keep doing rehab. And they use it as sort of a catch-all, which is a little irritating. And so I think all of those that are doing rehab absolutely have the best opportunity to identify complications because they're seeing these patients sometimes on a weekly basis, sometimes twice a week basis. And so, you know, the first step being send back to the person that did the surgery. Um, the second step being is learning to say, is what we're seeing going on a complication associated with the surgery that could be corrected? 
or is this something where perhaps the tissues aren't conditioned to the point that I'm pushing the animal? Maybe I need to back off. Maybe I need to uh, potentially head in a different direction. Um, as far as cruciate ligament injuries go, uh, what I would say is the probably biggest thing that I think an animal would not do well initially would be if there's meniscal pathology that was either not addressed at the time of surgery or missed at the time of surgery. There are little nuances of every procedure, which is why I think the book is, is helpful because it really kind of talks about the peculiarities in terms of why a dog following a extra capsule repair might not be doing well versus a dog following a TPLO because we, yeah, we could classify them and say, okay, the dog had knee surgery, but there's different tissues that are manipulated and there's different nuances that could be causing a dog to not do well following one of those procedures. Meniscal pathology is, is common across the board in, in all of those. And some would argue it could be higher risk factor in patients after certain procedures. And so, you know, having that basic knowledge of what that procedure is and what are potential uh, issues that could arise because of that particular procedure uh, I think can be very helpful. And then the other thing too, as far as the textbook goes with a chapter on rehab is, you know, very rarely are we as individuals that are uh, providing rehabilitation support going to truly cause a complication. But we also need to look at and understand tissue healing so that we're not pushing the patient to create undue stiffness or soreness that might cause a setback or cause us to have to progress at a, at a slower rate. And so, you know, I think we can use rehab to not only address those things, but also pick up on complications earlier before it becomes more of a catastrophic problem. Yeah. I mean, one of the questions I was going to ask you, what are the common complications of CCL surgery? But now I realize I probably should have said of each surgery. So what is the <laughs> most common one of, of each of the surgery? Maybe we can just start there. Yeah. So, you know, with, with extra capsular repairs, it can be due to a lack of, of instability. So there's still instability in the stifle. Many times that arises from either uh, not utilizing appropriate landmarks. And so when the dog walks, there's still instability there. For our intracapsular repairs, it's a tough one. Uh, but one of the probably biggest issues is either stretching or tearing of the graft prematurely. With our osteotomy procedures, a lot of it is the dynamics in terms of cutting the bone and how, you know, from the orthopedic world, how kind are we to the soft tissues? Because we are cutting into the bone, we are rotating or advancing something. Um, and then we're putting implants in. And so it's ensuring that we don't have implant damage. Ultimately, with this day and age, with the development of locking plate technology and improvement of implants, the, the fear of, of plates and screws falling apart, I think, is, is extremely rare and very uncommon these days. But, you know, things like surgical site infections, you know, in, in the case of putting a uh, metal plate or, or screws or even braided material for an extra capsule repair, infection risk is, is a big, big one. And so, you know, really paying attention to an incisional healing and, and not only just looking at the incision and saying, oh yeah, it looks good. You know, it's, it's a little bit puffy or a little bit red, but really scrutinizing the incision and, and looking for very small details so that way we can be aggressive um, to minimize surgical site infections. I think, you know, across the boards, but our osteotomy procedures probably carry a little bit higher of, a, of infection rate compared to some of the others. And so, you know, then there can be other little nuances. And sometimes if we do an osteotomy procedure and maybe we've inadvertently induced some angulation or torsional changes in the bone. Now the, the limb is loading atypically, so that could be problematic. And, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, one of the things too is, is with a torn cruciate ligament, there is a inflammatory response in the stifle. And some patients, uh, regardless of, of what's done, even if the knee stable can have a residual or continued inflammatory response. And, and I don't think we pay much attention to that thought process or the thought process of patellofemoral pain. You know, in people, that's, that's a big ordeal. And, 
you know, we tend to kind of ignore it um, in the dog. So I think there's a few things that are probably under-recognized with some of these procedures. Something that I used to see in practice quite a lot is especially those dogs that had like a chronic cruciate and they had a lot of muscle wastage. Um, we would find that, you know, post-surgery, they would also have a patella luxation, which would usually correct itself after a bit of strengthening. Is that something that you find too? Yeah, I, I think we can see patella luxation in two scenarios. One being if there's really severe quadriceps atrophy, and, and it's going to be a little more patellar maltracking. So, you know, the underlying axial skeleton and the um, quadriceps mechanism are in alignment, but there's just a lot of quadriceps atrophy or there could be a uh, substantial periarticular fibrosis on the medial aspect, wanting to kind of pull on the retinaculum a little bit. And as you mentioned, uh, strengthening typically will help resolve that. I've also seen patella luxation uh, following some of our osteotomy procedures as a result of the procedure where we inadvertently shift or move something and then we induce niatrogenic patella luxation. And so those can absolutely be recognized, especially, and, and I think it's very important if, if there is not a patella luxation before surgery and there's one after surgery, that's something that definitely needs to be scrutinized and then us figure out, um, is it because of muscle loss or is it because of something we accidentally uh, induced during surgery. And then to go along with the dogs with chronic cruciate ligament tears, along with atrophy, we also see a, a loss of range of motion. And, and I think it's important to remember that range of motion is directly correlated to limb function. And so one of our utmost important goals should be to regain and reestablish range of motion if we can. And I think there are some of those dogs that we need to have uh, direct conversations to the owners if they have really severe changes and already a substantially reduced range of motion, you know, what the outcome following surgery may be and the expectations uh, should be. Because in my mind, that dog, even if I do a TPLO, I'm going to probably tell the owner the outcome's likely not going to be as good as the dog that goes into a TPLO with a normal range of motion in the stifle. And obviously also looking at osteoarthritic changes, if there's quite a lot of change already there, then we're going to manage the expectations. Yeah, for sure. So you, you mentioned in the book that you actually had a whole chapter on cats. So I'm interested to know what your the top complications in cats are. You know, interestingly enough, you know, we have all these ideas on osteotomy procedures in, in the dog. And, you know, if we advance the tuberosity to a certain degree, that helps stabilize the knee. If we rotate the proximal tibia to a certain degree, that helps stabilize the knee. And, and we kind of carried over those same thought processes to the cat. And interestingly enough, and, and you know, perhaps my knowledge base in the feline surgery world wasn't as in-depth as it should have been because what I've what I learned from the authors of, of that chapter is that the studies that were done don't really support stabilizing the cat stifle following the same guidelines as the dog and so I think there's a lot of work there that needs to be done um, and also this recognition of meniscal calcification and what's the importance of, of that um, either preoperatively or postoperatively and, and you know is that truly causing an issue or or not I think in the cat we don't typically see the typical degenerative breakdown of the cruciate ligament and so many at times it can be uh, combined with other ligamentous damage or what's called a deranged stifle and so Going back to that identification before committing to surgery, one of the things that uh, I think commonly gets missed is other ligamentous injuries in the cat. So yes, the knee's unstable and we know the cat's got a torn cruciate ligament, but oh, by the way, we didn't recognize the cat has a caudal cruciate tear or a medial collateral, lateral collateral tear prior to getting into surgery. And if we don't recognize those things, then we can expect a pretty poor outcome following surgery. So, I mean, you're a surgeon, so surgeons like to cut, but it, I know that you also are in rehab, you know, and so, um, you know, there are a lot of surgeons that are not very pro rehab, but you're a surgeon that is. So, I mean, are there any circumstances where you recommend a conservative approach and not a surgical approach? Yeah, so I, I think that, you know, in, in patients that have what I would call a competent, stable partial tear, and, and these are dogs that 
maybe have a little bit of offloading, uh, maybe some stiffness or soreness. Um, they're intermittently lame. On examination, there's no instability in flexion or extension. There, you know, in some situations, there's some discomfort on hyperextension, and they've got radiographic evidence of effusion. I'll talk to these owners sometimes about conservative approaches. If I've got dogs that are candidates or, or that would be very high risk candidates for anesthesia, obviously we'll talk about conservative management for them. You know, the age factor is a, a challenging one. In my clinical cases, it tends to be whenever the dog hits the age of about 10 is when, is when owners start saying, well, you know, is, is age going to play a role here? And, you know, unfortunately, there's just not a line in the sand. I, I think, you know, to minimize chances of complications, you know, we probably need to think a little bit more of thorough diagnostics for these guys, you know, aside from our routine preoperative uh, blood work and your analysis, maybe think about things like thoracic and abdominal radiographs and preoperative ECGs, just to make sure that we're not missing something that could set us up for a complication. But interestingly, we have a, a whole chapter devoted to um, complications associated with orthotics, because uh, I know orthotics is, is one of these growing areas. And, and I think from where we were, say, six, seven years ago to where we are now, things have certainly advanced. Unfortunately, the the publication of research hasn't really advanced, but what people are doing and have the capability to do has advanced. And, and I think there are certain candidates that could be a good fit for orthotics, but there really wasn't anywhere that said, you know, if you use an orthotic, here are what the expectations should be. And then here are complications because they themselves have a whole set of, of potential issues uh, that we need to discuss. And so Brian Torres and, and Steve Budsberg uh, wrote that chapter and, and did a phenomenal job because they've done some research looking at what is the knee doing within the stifle brace? What's the stifle brace doing on the knee? And, and then also looking at some complications associated with that and, and provided some good information within the chapter there with the whole goal being either the surgeon or the, the general veterinarian or the physiotherapist can, you know, read that and say, okay, now I've got a good grasp. So that way, when I go in to talk to this owner about conservative management, when I go in to talk to this owner about what to expect with an orthotic, I'm geared with more information to provide them. Yeah, I mean, another one of the conservative approaches that, um, you know, we've chatted to vets about and is specific vet Steve Wimberley, he does a lot of prolotherapy. So I don't know if you've heard any of his podcasts or any of his Facebook lives, do you have any thoughts on using prolotherapy? He's had quite a lot of success um, and he's been documenting for, I think, the last sort of four years, all his cases. And, and his outcomes have been really good and especially venting contralateral cruciate ruptures. So he does prolotherapy on both knees. Any thoughts on that? I don't have any direct experience with prolotherapy. I, I have, unfortunately, had to treat a dog that had a septic arthritis secondary to, to prolotherapy. You know, I, I think there's lots of avenues that could be explored. I think if an individual has something that is um, perceived to be effective, then my first encouragement is to please get objective information and publish it and then go through the peer review process because that's when we, I think we can take things uh, more seriously. And then as far, you know, and the biggest thing you said there was, you know, minimizing contralateral tears. I think if that is in true a way to minimize contralateral tears, then it absolutely needs to be published because right now, you know, there's absolutely nothing in the published literature that's been shown to decrease the chances of, of contralateral tears. And so if, if indeed that does, that's substantial evidence that needs to be out there. So that could be considered to be incorporated into, you know, whether a dog's being treated conservatively on both knees or whether a dog has surgery on one knee and, and possibly prolotherapy on the other, if it's going to decrease the chances of, of contralateral tears, I think that could be pretty groundbreaking. And I would look forward to, to hopefully seeing those, those results because that could, that could be a big game changer. Yeah, he's actually a surgeon. So that, and that's exactly what he does. So when he operates on the knee, he does prolotherapy on the other side. So I think I was in touch with one another and he can share, share his findings with you. I think uh, you'd, you'd find it very interesting. Yeah, no, that, I think that would be, uh, that would be really cool. Cause I think, you know, one of the hardest conversations as a surgeon that we have is, is I go through the whole aspect of cruciate ligament disease. And then I say, you know, by the way, 
there's a 50 to 60% chance it's a, your dog's going to tear the other side or even another common presentation. Just yesterday, I had a dog that was limping on, on one leg, but had bilateral cruciate ligament disease. And that's a really hard one to swallow because now that we just went from something that's expensive to something that's very expensive. So, you know, if we have any way that can minimize a risk factor in a safe manner, I would be absolutely all for it. Because right now, the only thing we can say is, well, for every two pounds of weight they put on after surgery, that increases the risk factor. You know, I would love to be able to tell owners if we do X, Y, and Z, we're going to decrease the chances of the other side. I think that would be phenomenal. Yeah, and what's great is they're under anesthetic anyway. So, and you can pick, pick sure. it as a surgical site, you know, you can minimize infection by doing that. And, yeah. Thanks so much, David. So, I mean, I've really enjoyed this chat now um, about your textbook and I'm sure there are all the vet rehabbers out there are wondering where they can get it. So won't you let us know um, how they can purchase it? What website should they go to? Yeah. So ultimately the easiest way would probably be to visit my, my personal website, which is drdaviddykus.com. And then uh, once that website pulls up, there's usually a, uh, a hyperlink that'll pop up that'll uh, send you to Amazon to, to purchase it. Um, the, other, the other way to do that would be just to go through Amazon and type in complications in canine CCL surgery and it should pop up. I'm not entirely sure, but it was a sponsored book series by the American College of Veterinary Surgeons or ACVS. Uh, so at acvs.org, they may have the opportunity to buy it there. And then what I would say is at conferences, hopefully as, as in-person things start to become more common, in uh, many of the conferences in the exhibit halls, there will be book providers. And, and many a times if, if they carry Wiley publishing books, you could find it in, in some conferences. Or lastly, if you have trouble finding it, you can always just reach out to me directly and I can put, point you in the right direction to the purchase. Yeah. So why don't you share with us your Instagram handle and your Facebook handle so people can just message you on social media. I think that's probably the easiest. Sure. So on Facebook, uh, my Facebook page is Dr. David Dykus. And then on Instagram, it's ortho underscore vet. Awesome. And now if you're not busy enough, <laughs> writing textbooks and lecturing and operating, I believe that you've also um, start, started Nexus Vet Me Bone and Joint Center recently. And you're doing some really exciting things with continued education. Why don't you share with the listeners just very quickly what you've been up to there? Yes. So ultimately, I'm, I'm in the process of, of helping start up a uh, new multi-specialty hospital in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. So it's in the eastern side of the United States. It's, it's called Nexus Veterinary Specialist. So I'm, I'm overseeing that. But then, with, but then the orthopedic department that I developed is the Nexus Veterinary Bone and Joint Center, where we can have a focus on more advanced orthopedics and joint replacement and, and all the fun stuff. But the other thing that along with clinical duties that I've always enjoyed is, is lecturing and teaching. And so as part of the, the Nexus brand, it it's, falls under the Bill's Best uh, company. So we, we have a, a sister hospital in, in Texas and another hospital in uh, Utah. But because of the desire to teach, um, we also have a continuing education component, which is Bill's Best CE which provides hands-on laboratories in both Utah and Maryland. And so we have space for the CE courses, whether it's orthopedics, whether it's soft tissue, dentistry, internal medicine, radiology, you know, whatever. But for the surgery aspect, since that's my passion, is, is what I try to do is create another level of, of dimension to the, the learning experience. And so an individual could come and take, say, a, a patella luxation course, and, and we would go through the lectures, the hands-on labs, do the cadaver work, and you can leave there saying, okay, I, I feel comfortable doing this, but then you get back to your hospital, and, and you're like, okay, how should I position the dog? How should I use my assistance? How should I have things set up? So what we've actually done is, is within one of our operating rooms, we've created a big glass wall, and adjacent to that is the conference room. And we have cameras in the ceiling pointing down to the operating room and the surgery site. And then um, we have these big TV monitors in the conference room. And then we have two-way communication. And, and the goal there is to say, okay, we just completed a patella luxation course. We have this clinical patella luxation case. So what happens is, is they get to sit in the conference room, enjoy some food, uh, maybe a coffee. They can communicate directly with me and I can communicate with them. And then they can see on the monitors 
what's going on in the surgical field as well as through the glass walls to see what's going on in the operating room, just to kind of get an idea of, of the setup, the positioning, where my hands go, where my assistant's hands go, just so it adds a little bit more information that they can take back when they start to introduce some of these procedures into their uh, to their own hospitals. So, you know, the hope there was to kind of bridge the, the CE learning with the clinical aspect and make it such that we can have a number of individuals getting to see that information rather than trying to have people crowded behind me in the operating room, standing on their tiptoes, looking in and, and not really being able to see much. Yeah, I and mean, I love it, the advances that we've had in technology. So I remember, you know, as a newly qualified vet, you know, going to practices and trying to look and see what was going on. And you really couldn't, you couldn't see anything because right. you couldn't get close it's enough. Tough. Right? Yeah. And then it's you tough. just look at the textbooks and read them. And then when you had to do the op, you just, you know, and it would have been awesome to be able to watch a whole lot from start to finish. And you can actually have a textbook right there, go through the procedure. Okay, this is actually what he's doing and then ask the question. So I think it's awesome. David, it. thank you so much for your time. And yeah, good luck with your new venture. I'm really excited about it. And I'm sure there are some vet rehabbers out there are going to reach out to you. Maybe they're interested um, to come and do some continuing education with you. And I'm really hoping that you've inspired some of them to, to get into writing textbooks so we can expand our textbooks. I was actually having a look at the textbooks that I had and I actually found this textbook. Um, so for those of you that are listening, it's the very first edition. I don't know if anyone else has got one. It's the very first edition of canine rehabilitation and physical therapy. And I think we're on like I think there's yep, a third edition. I've got it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so way back then and that was at one stage I remember that being the only textbook. That was it. That was the, the textbook. And now I've got a shelf full, so it's awesome. So thank you for contributing and 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 writing and 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 teaching like you do. We really appreciate it. Absolutely, I, I'm happy to. I mean, that's what fuels me to keep uh, keep learning and keep going. So uh, you know, I, I certainly love uh, networking and socializing with everyone. And so hopefully, fingers crossed, we can do some more of that this this coming year and in the future. Yeah, hopefully we see you at IAVPT conference if in Cambridge be, if, in August. If I, I'll, I'll never pass up an opportunity to get to England. So if I can do it, I'll be there. All right. Holding times, I'll see you. Thank you, David. <laughs> yeah, Thanks absolutely. for your time. Thank Bye. you. Have a good one. If you enjoyed this podcast, please hit the subscribe button so you get notified every time I load a new podcast. And please, if you get a moment, head over to Stitcher or iTunes and leave me a review. It's a really lonely job being a podcaster. And so the only time I get to hear from you or know that you're out there is when I get a review and know that I read every single one of your reviews. So to those of you that have left reviews, I want to say a very, very big thank you. Every time we get a review, it really helps to get the Vet Knee Rehabilitation Podcast out there to all the vet rehabbers all over the world. All right, vet rehabbers, so if you are looking for more continuing education in the field of veterinary rehabilitation, head over to onlinepetout.com. Go be awesome, guys.